This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, Chad, do you know if we have a quorum yet? Um, three more members to make a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Waiting for two two more members to form the quorum. Okay. Still waiting for two more members to form the quorum. I just wondered if there are members on the phone call that join and then we could hear uh, those are on the phone.
city of Wichita council meeting is going. So some of the members from there are still in the meeting. Do we know who Caller 5 and City Admin is? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's, yeah, one more member, I think. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more time. Chair, we have four on. Should we have quorum? Okay. All righty. We now have a quorum. So I'd like to welcome and thank everybody for being here. Uh, appreciate it. With that, uh, regular business, we will approval of the September 8th agenda. If you could ch hit the chat and. Uh, or just say it. So a motion in a second. Thank you, Brett. Okay, I'll second. We've got a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Aye. thank you. Uh, approval of the, the agenda for uh, August 11th, or the minutes, excuse me. Any changes or corrections? I need a motion and a second. I make a motion to approve the minutes as written. Okay. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, moving on to uh, director's report. Chad? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, board members, good afternoon. Quick update on the safety committee and active transportation committee. Uh, today we have updates, most of the agenda. Um, this upcoming freight, regional freight plan presentation by Sarah Clark from Trans Systems and also safety crash data from KDOT, Lisa Hecker. So before those new business updates, I'd like to provide you a summary of uh, safety and health committee as well as active transportation committee. We had a, uh, the safety and health committee and active transportation committee is a, uh, we are pleased with the start of this because this partnership, this coordination, this data review and the data accuracy, all this we lead to the next transportation plan update that's in five years. So the development of transportation plan in five years would take a lot of effort on data review and accuracy and the decision making process uh, based on robust data and then accurate data that we check each other both member jurisdictions as well as MAPO staff. So that's why we are very pleased to see the progress on this. So let me go to the next slide. Um, on our website, we have included um, the clarity on who can become the member and what are the goals and accomplishments the members of this committee would be. Let me go to the next slide really quick. Uh, this you have already seen uh, the safety and crash data. And later on in this meeting, Dr. Elizabeth Abla would be presenting a summary of the update of this meeting as well. 
So let me quickly go to the next slide. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Abla, the chairperson, um, has led the meeting on August 12th. Uh, also, um, Jack Brown and Dr. Elizabeth Abla both are very talented. Uh, they both have great ideas on how to make this safety committee more productive in the next two or three years. For example, there were some great ideas such as, you know, how can drug and alcohol, mental health issues that is very dear, uh, mental health issues, especially very dear to our Commissioner David Dennis. Such uh, ideas were brought up uh, and then I'm very pleased that uh, this group is very committed in uh, finding out what are the ways the safety can be improved in the region and how do we document those, how do we collect the data, uh, both in terms of safety as well as health. So that's on safety and health committee. And the next meeting is on November 4th. Uh, these occur quarterly, so every three months. So the next meeting is on November 4th. Um, let me quick provide a quick update on active transportation committee as well. Uh, Jack Brown and Alan Killer, they both are uh, leading at the moment, and they have reviewed the maps of the previous uh, uh, system bike bread bike bread and trail system and then we also are included uh, scott Wedel, who has great ideas from city of wichita on the past so we have great group of people that form and we also have council member jack slip from derby as well so we have a great group of individuals that uh, and then many are joining as well and then i always we always would love to have more participation in these committees uh, we also have participation in kdart as well um, Jenny from KDOT also is part of this committee. So really, we are really excited uh, to have start of this, but there is more ways to go for us, two to three years, and then we would love to include as many um, jurisdictions as possible, because the more participation in, from the region, the more we can uh, see what connections are missing, how can we enhance the regional connections, and so forth. Uh, let me go to the next slide really quick. Uh, I just want to provide uh, the two meetings that are upcoming on Active Transportation Committee. One is tomorrow, Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. And the following meeting after this, after that is uh, December 9th. That is September, September, November, December. So three months later. Um, so that's all for the update on, uh, let me go to the next couple of slides. And, um, that's all on the update. Any questions, I'd be happy to elaborate or include before we go to um, bike counts and UPWP. Go to the next slide. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. This is Jim Benoist with Bel Air. Uh, I was looking at some of the safety data from 2013 or 2017 and 2018 and the crashes that uh, Cedric County has experienced versus Johnson County. And we've been looking at um, what is doing they seem to be reducing the number of crashes even though they have a population of probably 100,000 more than than Cedric County does but they're they're having some success somehow I don't know what they're doing there. <laughs> that's a great question and a great observation today we have Lisa Hecker from KDOT presenting on the same topic uh, Lisa and I discussed about this uh, during the TAC meeting presentation that you know, we really would like to investigate what were some of the measures that were taken in Johnson's County. Uh, we are still evaluating the underlying causes for those, and Lisa would elaborate more in the, you know, in the update, uh, new business update. It's a great observation. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, we have uh, the, the UPWP budget estimates that we are revising. Um, you know, we had the estimates of UPWP 2020 in the fall of 2019, but as time progresses, some of those changes in the budget and the activities of the staff and BAMPO. So for that reason, we are revising 2020 UPWP budget and then we'll, we'll will come to you for approval of the revised budget. And we'll also be uh, seeking your approval on 2021 
UPWP budget. We are working closely with Rene Hart from Topeka Kid Art. Uh, so we would be, this is just an upcoming um, action items for the next couple of months uh, that we would like to keep you posted. Uh, and that's all on this uh, UPWP. I think the next item is bike pet counts uh, on this report. The bike pet counts, we have all volunteers filled for 35 count locations on the bike pet. And we are so happy that, uh, you know, there's a waiting list of volunteers as well. Two days, Thursday and Friday, two hours. Um, the volunteers that, you know, committed for this task of counting the bike and pedestrian is a great help. Uh, we are very appreciative of, uh, you know, uh, the strength of volunteers in the Wichita area, and then we are very inspired as well, uh, and we are excited to work with each other in this task in September, uh, the end of September, Thursday and Saturday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have at the moment. Okay. Uh, public comments. Or did you have anything on the UPWP update or anything else on that? Good to go. Okay, uh, public comments? Uh, no public comments? Okay, new business update. W Wampo Regional F uh, Freight Plan. Ka um, Karen, Paige. Um, Sarah Clark and Karen. If Karen is not there, Sarah, feel free to. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, Sarah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Karen was unable to get out of a meeting um, that was previous to this one. So I'll introduce the plan and if Karen is able to arrive before we're finished, we'll have her add uh, a few words to the discussion. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sarah Clark. I'm with Trans Systems. I'm the uh, technical lead for the regional freight plan that is being uh, completed as an update um, to WAMPO. Um, for this project, we were working with Cambridge Systematics to complete the regional freight plan. And I believe Lizzie is on the line with us today as well. The purpose of the freight plan is to position the region to have manageable actions to move through the transportation decision making process in the pursuit of implementation of forward facing freight and freight benefiting projects. The freight plan was supported by a committee of members that represent private sector industries, various agencies in the region, and the state DOT. Uh, this the freight committee supported the plan throughout the process by participating in interactive exercises that you can see off to the right to help us prioritize needs for the region and action steps that address those needs on various topics related to freight transportation. The committee was led by Karen Page, who hopefully you will be able to hear from a little bit later, um, and she will be the chairperson for the committee going forward. To start off the plan, we reviewed several documents that are guiding documents for the region and different plans that have been put in place related to freight um, in the region and um, at the state level. These existing documents help to set the existing conditions for the region and have an understanding of what the freight transportation network and the freight transportation system consists of. A commodity flow exercise was completed, and this allowed us to understand what uh, goods are moving in, out, and through the region. And to, in 2017, 34 million tons of freight valued at $52 billion moved throughout the region. Um, as you can see from the slide, those volumes will increase into 2040. Uh, the region is very heavy on cereal grains and transportation equipment. Agriculture and aviation are top industries within the region uh, that were evident through the data that we analyzed in the commodity flows. 
The freight network consists of highways, railroads, airports, pipelines, and a broadband network that supports the technology aspects of the region. There are many assets that are, are helpful in advancing uh, freight transportation in the region. Uh, many of your highway network is supporting uh, traffic or truck traffic through the region, and there are very few bottlenecks in the region, mostly associated where um, different modes either interact or where there are um, heavily traveled interchanges. Freight facilities are present throughout the region. The aerospace and agriculture sectors are important, and there are many facilities for aviation, but the primary cargo facilities are at ICT. Um, that manufacturing facilities throughout the region are also important um, for those freight shipments that are um, origin or destination uh, within the region. There's also many rail facilities throughout the region, and we're looking through the needs for any enhancements to those throughout the plan. The plan also reviewed different trends that are occurring in the freight industry, such as e-commerce. Um, e-commerce during the COVID-19 pandemic has become a very important component of freight transportation. Uh, many of you have probably ordered things online during this period and have changed your behaviors because of different restrictions to travel. The e-commerce situation has exploded and it is changing demand on our transportation network. And the plan does make, the plan does acknowledge that those changes are occurring and should be reviewed into the future. Agencies are also ensuring that their transportation systems are resilient to make sure that things like a pandemic or a weather event can, it can be accommodated with the transportation network in place. Private industry does business continuity plans to accommodate those um, different events, and the plan does acknowledge that those things are important for the region to understand. One of the topics of conversation with the freight committee and throughout the region have been transload facilities. Um, this is an illustration of a transload facility, the photograph on the slide. It's moving a product from one conveyance to another, so from a rail car onto a truck or from a truck onto a rail car. And understanding how those facilities can support the region is something that is important and has been brought up many times. Providing the ability to make those shipment moves in a consolidated place, potentially not at the industry itself, but in a yard uh, located nearby helps provide efficiencies for industries in the region. Other trends that were investigated were smart and dedicated infrastructure, using technology to improve transportation and services, uh, private sector vehicle technology, like unmanned aerial systems or drones, or uh, connected autonomous vehicles. Um, those can improve safety and optimize freight transportation efficiency. And those are things that are happening at a larger level throughout the country that the region should be aware of and understand how they impact tra transportation here in Wichita. Delivery and distribution advances, those can impact shipping patterns. So understanding where distribution centers or warehouses are located will be important to understand how that impacts transportation and the need for different roadway infrastructure or railroad infrastructure in the region. Great technology and data. Um, there's many benefits to sharing the the information between the public and private sector and understanding how those data can be maintained um, confidentiality and resources that are applic applicable to the public sector. And so there are other regional studies that are occurring that WAMPO is a part of um, that should help inform one of these trends that is important to the region. As far as needs for the region, there are some congestion locations related to highway interchange bottlenecks, um, but overall the region does have a robust transportation system that does support the freight industry. Um, later on, I understand you're going to be uh, hearing a presentation about safety. Um, as far as commercial vehicles, the crashes and fatalities are trending in a downward direction, which is a very uh, positive thing. There are few bridge restrictions in the region from a oversize, overweight um, aspect, uh, but addressing those that do remain in the region are important. 
Uh, truck parking can be monitored with an electronic logging device, which is a requirement for the drivers to have in their vehicles. A state is providing um, information to drivers, as you can see in the photograph on this slide, of where available parking is throughout the region, which can increase safety and provide more efficient shipments for those trucks. Um, looking at rail access for heavier and transload shipments is something that the region should have um, on its radar going forward. And air cargo facilities um, and customs processing is important for the region, as we've heard from the airport authority. As part, of the pro as part of the freight plan update, we provided a list of priority actions that the region should um, maintain and, and make progress on as the plan is implemented. Um, the actions are illustrated in this matrix on this slide, and we'll show a couple of uh, more slides of those. Uh, the topics on the left are those that were identified through the needs analysis for the region. So things like uh, roadway and bridge needs, congestion and bottleneck specifics. Um, the MPO itself as uh, an agency has functions that it's required to maintain over time. So things like project evaluation um, and then data processing or data um, analysis to make sure that uh, information uh, feeds into the decision-making process. So the MPO will lead things like those two items. Those are things that are done either on an annual basis or an ongoing basis. And to know if you're successful at those, um, you can understand if projects that support freight um, or benefit freight are selected, or if those data storage solutions are in place to make sure that those that data is available for future plans and updates. One of the items that was important to the stakeholder committee as we advanced the project was looking at transload facilities. And that's the fourth item on this slide. Um, evaluating the need for transload facilities was something that was important to the stakeholder group to make sure that it, um, different industries are supported and that the transportation network is responsive to that. WAMPO as an organization and the committee, the freight committee can support um, that evaluation. This is something that can happen at any time, can be an ongoing evaluation. And to understand if it's successful, you'll know when it's complete and what steps need to be carried forward um, after that evaluation is completed. Additionally, the committee found that freight technology was of an importance to them and looking at engaging at the state with plans that are being developed at the state level, um, looking at a technology working group at the MPO level, not just to cover freight, but maybe other modes as well. And then to also respond to changes in industry with automation and other um, technologies that industry is putting in place. That's a summary of the plan that we've put in place um, with the support of the freight committee and the actions that have been identified. I do see that Karen has joined the call and if she has a few words that she'd like to share, um, I'd like to turn it over to her. Okay, Karen. Yeah, I apologize to everyone for my tardiness and uh, meeting that ran into this one. Um, I just wanted to thank Sarah and the Transit Sims team for um, a very thorough um, freight plan. And then to um, TPB, I just want to uh, call your attention to the fact that we have a freight plan um, that considers working with the private community with the uh, freight committee. So that's evident that they're working with the private sector. Um, and that we have a freight plan um, is um, a great indicator to Kansas Department of Transportation that not only are we working together, but we're considering freight and have done a thorough job of identifying priorities. This could be an opportunity for, um, for WAMPO and the region to compete more, be more competitive in competing for, you know, state level dollars. And certainly it um, is a strong signal to the federal government that, um, that we've thoroughly considered this and include the private sector. It, it signals things like we're prepared, we're thinking of it, and we're collaborating. Um, I'll end, end with just a final comment. The next time the freight committee meeting meets will be at the end of October, October 28th in the morning. 
Um, if any of you would like to join, we would love to have you so you can engage in that conversation on freight as well. Chad, did I cover everything? Yes, absolutely, Karen. I just want to provide the uh, chair and the board members a quick update on the next steps. Um, our, you know, um, Brent um, Letkowski from Transystems, Sarah, uh, they both are uh, taking the next steps towards transload facilities, identifying the need for transload facilities and the, you know, who owns the transload facilities and a possible a tour for the freight committee members. So those are the next steps happening and the plan being developed, we are happy to coordinate with DOT. And also there's a region-wide uh, uh, mega region freight project that's going on. That's between the MPS of Kansas City, Omaha, uh, St. Louis and uh, Wichita, and then a few other MPOs around. So this is a good start for us to share the com commodity flows across the region and what type of commodities are flowing. Um, so we are excited about this project and we want to thank Sarah and um, Brent, uh, you know, for uh, Brett Letkowski for their contributions. And uh, as always, Karen, thank you for your leadership as well. That's all. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Next, we're going to go to the safety and crash data update. Lisa? Lisa, we can hear you, Lisa. Are you there, Lisa? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Not sure which microphone I'm using here. Hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, um, I'm Lisa Hecker. I'm a program consultant at KDOT in the Bureau of Transportation Safety and Technology. KDOT maintains a crash data unit, which is the state's primary repository for all motor vehicle crashes on Kansas roadways. The data is used to identify traffic safety issues, and that data shows that most crashes are not the result of a bad road, but are the result of a driver's poor choices. The road can be in perfect condition, but if the driver is speeding, distracted, impaired, or doing any other unsafe activity, he could crash because of his poor driving behavior. But on the other hand, the road could be in terrible condition, but a safe driver might not crash. I have some local data for you today, but first I want to share a few statistics. In Kansas, five out of every six motor vehicle crashes are the result of driver error. That's about 83%. The other 17% are caused by something the driver can't control, such as the weather or an animal running into the road. And the saddest statistic of all, driver error is the cause of 95% of all fatal crashes. That one always gets to me. 95% of fatal crashes could be avoided if every driver drives safely all the time. I'll go to the next slide there. This is some crash data we put together for Sedgwick County. And uh, I want to tell you first about how we get this data. The law enforcement officer on scene at a crash fills out the crash report and will note if people are injured, not injured, or killed. The officer also assigns categories. The categories are a combination of driver contributing circumstances and crash types. Each crash could have multiple driver contributing circumstances or crash types. For example, one crash could involve an impaired older driver not wearing a seatbelt who crashed at an intersection under construction. This crash would be represented in five categories. There would be the impaired, older driver, seatbelt, intersection, and construction. So five categories there. So um, that's why the numbers look maybe, you know, they seem kind of high, but that's because there could be several different circ contributing circumstances for each crash. County here, we'll just kind of go over that a little bit. Um, total crashes for five years, 56,810. And we use the five-year average to kind of even out any kind of a year that might have a, a fluke to it. Um, maybe, maybe one year there's a terrible winter, so there's more crashes that year because of the bad roads, whereas the other four years, the winter wasn't that bad. So the other four years kind of make it be more of a, a general idea of what you're actually seeing, more of a true picture of what you're seeing, rather than just focusing on that one year. Same thing if 
perhaps there had been a a bus crashed or something, and you had a bunch of people hurt on or even killed in a bus crash. So the other four years would kind of help even that out and give you a better picture of what actually happened, um, for the gen what actually happened in the, in the area. Uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, left over there, the total crashes plus the fatal and serious injury, minor injury, possible injury, and PDO, which is property damage only. Uh, property damage only is that the cost to uh, the damage to the car was at least a thousand dollars or more. Which, gosh, nowadays it's pretty much every crash it costs so much to fix cars anymore. But a thousand dollars or more is considered property damage only. So that the first little grouping there is for the actual crash of the cars crashing. I mean, the actual crash. I mean, the next one's for people. Uh, there could be you know two or three people in each crash. So fatalities were 291 for those five years. Serious injuries 788. Minor about 9400. And possible injuries about 12,700 almost. That's the kind of data that we can get for you at uh, at KDOT. We can we go through the trash reports. Uh, whatever the law enforcement officer puts on the report is what we can have. We can record into our data. If they don't put on the report, we won't have that information. So we always ask the law enforcement officers to please very thoroughly fill out these reports because it helps us uh, help you all with your uh, traffic safety issues in your communities. So look at the big chart there to the, uh, to the other side there. The intersections is the number one uh, ca uh, category for crashes which is not, not a surprise in an urban area like Wichita. So we're not surprised to see that as, as such a, a large number. Next to distracted driving, which goes right with intersection crashes because sometimes quite often people are distracted and they crash at an intersection. Don't, they don't stop in time, not pay attention to bump the guy in front. You know how that goes intersection. Um, roadway departure, teen driver, older driver, speeding, I'll come on down. And I'm not gonna read all these to you guys. You can go back and look later on if, you, if you'd like, but. I'll uh, just kind of show you the kind of things that we can get for you at KDOT to give you a picture of what goes on with traffic safety there in the Cedric County area for, for the Wampo area. The next slide, please. And this is a, uh, an interesting map that one of my coworkers had. He said to toss it in here because I thought you guys would, would be uh, interested in seeing it. Uh, for the three years, 2016, 2017, 2018, um, the fatal crashes there in, um, in Cedric County. And it looks like you kind of see where, of course, more right there in the or urban area, you have more of them there. You can see we're down by, uh, what is that road there? E, uh, just a little bit north, east of Hayesville, there's several right there in a row there. But you get, you get some coming across at the 54 there. But it's kind of gives you an idea of where you have more of your fatal crashes. It's when it's focused on that, um, to see where, where, where you have more of the, more of the fatal crashes. The next slide, please. If I uh, asked our data person to get us some information on US 54 because that's one road that I'm most familiar with there in Wichita. I, uh, I started coming to Wichita like 1980 when my sister moved down there. And then she, she lived there for several years and moved back to Speaker. But still, every I go down to Wichita probably a couple times a year. But every time I'm in Wichita, it's always construction on 54. So I always remember 54 because I'm always waiting somewhere. It seems like or having to, to be careful around the cones and all. So um, I'm very familiar with 54. So and I also know that it's very busy, busy street there in your area, very busy roadway. So that's what's my information on that. And um, we have the five years again, 2015 through 2019. You can see um, one thing that has uh, caught my interest was the, number, the total number of crashes for 2015 is so much higher number than the other years. Um, the other years are pretty much consistent off, what, maybe 34. Uh, yeah, about 34, my biggest difference there between the different years. But then you jump up 150 almost for 2015. So we have done some checking into that. Um, I asked Don Snyder, he's our uh, a Wichita um, metro area engineer for KDOT. He checked into that for construction. I said, was there more construction on 54 that year than other years? He said, no, not really. He told me, told me what times they had it, and it didn't seem to be that much different than the other years. So then I checked the weather. I got some information on weather, and there wasn't that much weather-related issues that year either. So um, that could be any reason. It could just be one of those flukes that just happened, an, an anomaly that we don't know why that happened. 
I'm wondering if perhaps there is more construction just on the side roads around 54, and perhaps it brought more traffic onto 54 at that in that year. Maybe the vehicle miles traveled were higher that year. It's something to check also. Um, but the most important thing to take away from that chart with those num with that one year being higher is that that is the only year it was higher, and that was five years ago. So in the intervening four years there, we've not had that same kind of number. So whatever happened that year did not repeat itself, and that's the important thing to remember there. If it jumps up again in the future, we certainly want to take a look at that and see what the heck happened. But for now, I, I, I would myself, I would be too concerned about that at this point because it was such a long time ago, and we ruled out any kind of we ruled out the uh, obvious reasons it could have happened. So unless y'all want me to really dig into that one, I'm going to kind of let that go for now. Unless y'all want me to do something with it. Because if you go on look, continue looking over the um, the fatals were two fatals in 15 and 17, three in 19. So the fatals didn't increase and drastically as the total crashes did. So um, I don't know about the total crashes, but that's so high that one year. We can be look at it further if you'd like us to. Um, and then people and the people involved. So, okay, we'll go to the next slide. For, um, for the city of Wichita, um, again, we have the information over there to the side. Uh, the summary for the five years, total crash is 46,348. The fatals are listed, serious injury, minor injury. Um, the now below people, uh, 181 fatalities just in the city of Wichita for those five years. And again, if you go to the uh, to the other side, the chart there, intersections, there's number, you know, right up there again, number one, distracted driving close behind. No seatbelt comes up. That was not that high up on the chart for Sedgwick, but it, it moved up, I mean, for Sedgwick as a whole, but it moved up for Wichita by itself. So uh, perhaps there should be some uh, seatbelt education might be helpful for the Wichita area. Um, that could be helpful. OB departure is still up there. Team drivers, older drivers, speeding. So I think you guys can look at that later if you'd like, but won't need to go over the whole thing. Then the next uh, chart then is for um, Andover. And that one is uh, um, for the five years also. I included Andover and then Mulvane too because uh, that's part of your AMPO, I mean, your, your WAMPO uh, area there. So I wanted to include those for you. We've got 80, 877 total crashes in that five year span with one fatality, um, four serious injuries. Of course, your numbers are going to be smaller here. Andover is a smaller community than the others, not as, metro, not as urban, not as metropolitan as Wichita. So your numbers will be smaller. But you notice that intersections are still right up there as number one, closely followed by distracted driving, which I do believe go hand in hand with each other quite often. Teen drivers are still up there. Early departure, older drivers, the same things kind of keep popping up in the top, you know, 10, so eight or 10. Then the next one is for Mulvane. Okay. Um, yeah, the next slide is for, is with, is for Mulvane. And that one has a uh, total crashes 241, again, smaller community. Um, distracted driving uh, moved ahead of intersections in this in this particular uh, community. So that moved up. Um, total crashes was 241, two fatalities in that five year span. So there's just there's all kinds of things that we can gather for you, information and gather for you at, at KDOT. Um, this is what our, the community traffic safety teams that we're putting together. This is the kind of information that we present to those groups. Um, if they're looking for issues that they want to try to work on as a group to, to fix for the community, these are the kind of things that they can look at and say, hmm, you know, we want to see what's going on with, uh, with the intersections, which intersection is the worst. We can help you pinpoint which intersection has the most crashes and then see what time of day they were, uh, what kind of crashes they were, side angle or, or whatever the different kind they are. So we can help you with all that too with our with the, with the, with the crash reports. The next slide, please. This, this slide is the uh, county comparison that uh, one of my coworkers again asked me to show you guys. We are very concerned about this up in Topeka. We've had a couple different meetings about this. There's groups getting together talking about this. Um, and now they know that I've been speaking with you guys. They're bringing me into the meetings too. We, um, we noticed that Cedric County has more uh, fatal crashes for the last, for 2017, 2018 than Johnson County had. And Johnson County is a higher population. 
but it's not just a few more crashes, a few more fatal crashes, it's a lot more fatal crashes. And when you, when you look over at the, the number of crashes themselves, just like the number of crashes that have the number of, of that are fatal, the total of the crashes are off, just not that, not that much different. Actually, there's more crashes in Johnson County uh, in 2017, uh, 2018, Cedric took over a little more, but it's the fatal crashes of those total crashes, the ones that are fatal are higher in Wichita, I mean, the Cedric County area, and it's a lot higher. And that has us concerned. Checking into that, uh, Chad asked me to, uh, asked me to look into what Johnson County has done to lower their crash numbers. And, um, I don't know everything that they've done. I know some of what they've done. Destination Safe is a traffic safety coalition for the greater Kansas City area that covers both sides of the state line. This group is organized by Mid-America Regional Conference, or MARC. It's the MPO for the KC area. I'm KDOT's rep for this group, so I'm familiar with some of their traffic safety efforts. I can just kind of give you a little, a little brief overview. At Johnson County, law enforcement agencies have several enforcement campaigns that are scattered throughout the year. And I know that Cedric does a lot of that too, but the, the guys in, in Johnson County do, do quite a bit of that throughout the year. Um, Johnson also works with high school students about impaired driving, about wearing seat belts, and I'm pretty sure you guys do that too. Um, Johnson is also involved in a couple programs that provide child protection seats to families. They get involved with some grant money that's available that can help uh, provide child um, protection seats. They also participate in a multimedia public safety campaign that utilizes rural radio, social media, and digital media, and maybe some TV too, but I don't remember for sure. The campaign runs off and on throughout the year. So all year, all pretty much scattered throughout the year, they, they have something going on with the uh, media about public safety. And the funding for these programs comes from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. It's an agency within the U.S. Department of Transportation. KDOT receives grant money from NHTSA and it's been passed along to the communities with the, when they have eligible programs. So WAMPO can also apply for some of this grant money. So you guys think about what you might uh, want to do with some uh, with some safety dollars to help get the word out, what you can do, uh, enforcement, as some extra enforcement campaigns in there. I mean, let us know what you'd be interested in doing. We can look into the possibility of um, getting a grant just to see if your program's eligible. Chad also asked for a comparison between Sedgwick County and other similar counties in other Midwestern states. Even though Johnson County is also a Kansas County, there it's not exactly, I don't think it's fair to compare y'all to Johnson County exactly because Johnson County is right there next to Kansas City, Missouri, also this one big, huge metropolitan area. So let's let's compare each other, other communities that are very similar to the Cedric County area. So uh, KDOT's data team is checking into the counties for Des Moines, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, Tulsa, and Oklahoma City, and also Springfield, Missouri, and Madison, Wisconsin. And we're going to do the same sort of comparison as you see here for Cedric Johnson, Whiteout, Shawnee, Douglas, Leavenworth. Or I can compare all of those other uh, cities I just mentioned to um, Sedgwick. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be looking to the counties for those other towns too and see what we come up with. It might take a little while, but we're working on that now. So um, it has caught our attention in Topeka and we're trying to um, help you all figure out um, what happened there. And that's all I got. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Um, let's see, moving on to committee reports. Uh, Regional Freight, Karen, do you have anything else to add? I do not. Okay, thank you. And uh, safety and health, uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything? Good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth Abel. I'm at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Wichita, and I am on the TAC. I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, Chad asked me to just give a brief uh, introduction. I know that he talked briefly at the beginning of the meeting about our committee. We've had one meeting. We are uh, 
ready to, and uh, thank goodness Lisa was able to present uh, this data, uh, most of these data to us at that meeting. Uh, and we are now going to be moving into a little bit of, um, we're going to hear from City of Wichita around air quality so that we can get a better understanding of where we are with uh, air quality and what are maybe some, some goals that we need to be working toward. Uh, this is safety and health. Uh, so this is unique in that we are going to be addressing health uh, throughout the region. So we're very excited to be able to do this. I'm very pleased to be able to chair this group. Uh, for over the next two to three years, our plan is to identify uh, the problems that are really our, our biggest problems around safety and health. Uh, and our goals are then to uh, not only have a, a good understanding of what the problems are, but then figure out what are the interventions that are going to make the best use of our time and our energy uh, so that our funds are, are well placed as well, uh, so that we're able to uh, have some effective interventions. And um, obviously we're going to, as part of that process, uh, identify what the WAMPO region is already doing to address uh, these problems. So we will uh, be adding to the interventions. Um, and so we'll propose uh, how we would want to proceed for 2040 for the plan. Um, I'm very happy that we're going to be able to uh, bring in experts from across the region. And our intent is uh, to uh, present re results and reports to you all uh, so that you have a, a good understanding of, of what our problems are and uh, what we're proposing uh, might need to be done. And then we're also going to be bringing in uh, all of the folks on the TAC to ensure that we are addressing all of the community's needs and interests uh, around health and safety so that <clears throat> we are being representative. So uh, I'm very eager to get going and uh, very happy to accept any questions or uh, any concerns that you have. I'd love to hear on or offline. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Troy, do you have anything to add from the TAC? Um, we, we listened to the, sim or the same presentations that we had today and they went well. There was one uh, item that came out that's maybe for a future discussion here as well as on TAC. Um, perhaps a discussion on how uh, COVID now or in the future uh, might change tra transportation, how we use it, um, uh, not just in vehicles, but also in pedestrian and, and biking and, and other methods of transportation for those that can't travel on their own, maybe needing to rely on some of that. Anyway, it's just a discussion we started to have. Um, I took it offline for now, um, and I'd like to visit it either here or with TAC or the executive committee in the future to see how we might uh, go further with that discussion. Outside of that, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, can uh, Mike uh, Moriarty, do you have anything? Um, I don't. Were you gonna, uh, by chance, uh, Call on Brent as well. Yes, yes. I, was I, I might, I might cede my time to Brent. Uh, okay, that'd be fine. Brent, what do you got for us? Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to let Tom Hine give the update for Wichita because Tom is doing such an excellent job. Tom, would you go ahead and give the update for Wichita? I will. I will. And. And frankly, I am shocked that Lisa would say that we've always got construction on US 54. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. get it. Uh, it's kind of the running joke in Wichita, and she didn't she didn't know it when she walked into it. I think, but uh, yeah. But yeah, we have 11 highway projects going on right now on Wichita highways, and only three of them are on Kellogg. So let's look on the bright side. There. We do have a new project starting tonight on K96 from 135 to Webb Road that will be night work. Uh, it's pavement repair. If you drive that piece, you know that the, the asphalt on top of the concrete, both are in compromised uh, situations. And uh, so we'll do some patching this fall. And then in the, in the spring, we will do an overlay uh, to try to hold that highway together. We also have coming a new Which Way website and a new Can Drive website. Those will roll out in the next month. And so uh, as you go to whichway.org 
or candrive.org, you may see a new lineup, a new map, and a new way to, to view layers of information that we'll be offering uh, both statewide and in Wichita. So look for those, and uh, that's all from this end. Okay, thank you, Tom. Any questions for Tom? We appreciate it. Rick, do you have anything from feds? Uh, sure, a couple of updates. Uh, first off, uh, I think as most folks are aware, the our current federal federal legislation, the FAST Act, expires uh, September 30th. Uh, at this point, we do not have any legislation in place after that. Uh, the latest that we're receiving information-wise is that discussions are happening in the Senate and the House, uh, but nothing's been firmed up. We're anticipating a continuing resolution that would probably fund us at federal fiscal year 2020 levels in the first part of federal fiscal year 2021. So basically, what does that mean for WAMPO? I'm assuming that will probably be about the same amount of funding you're getting this year. Um, I do not have any idea of how long that continuing resolution is going to go or what will happen with that. Uh, but stay tuned. We have, frankly, we all are. So I um, wanted to give a kind of like on that, what's going on. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, the Federal Highway FHWA's Everyday Counts Initiative. Uh, we have just announced innovations for the next uh, year, next two years, 2021 to 2022. And uh, so I kind of wanted to let you all know what these are. More information will be coming out. Uh, and I know that in past, uh, you know, past years when we've had an EDC summit to showcase these innovations, uh, WAMPO has sent a representative. Um, so real quickly, the innovations that have been uh, nationally selected are crowdsourcing for advancing operations, uh, e-ticketing and digital as-builts, which is converting paper-based materials ticketing systems into electronic, uh, next generation traffic incident management, which is integrating technology, data, and training, strategic workforce development, uh, another technology is targeted overlay pavement systems, and uh, we have two more, virtual public involvement, which I think will really be of interest to WAMPO. And the last is ultra high performance concrete for bridge preservation and repair. So these have all just been announced, more information to come. Um, we will be having a summit, but given the current situation with COVID, this will be a virtual summit. Uh, so I know that uh, WAMPO is on our uh, State, Innovation, uh, State Transportation Innovation Committee uh, for Kansas. So more information will be coming soon on that. Um, that's all I have to report. Any questions okay. for me? <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Uh, the sure. Executive Commission, Committee did not meet uh, this month. We will be meeting next month, uh, so we don't have anything to report. Does anybody else have any business they need to bring up? Uh, if not, I appreciate you all being here, and we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.